When defeating a boss in Dark Souls 3, you are rewarded with a boss soul, which can only be used to get some souls until you acquire the Transposition Kiln from the Cursed Rotted Greatwood, which can be given to Ludlith and Firelink Shrine to unlock Soul Transposition, which allows you to trade in your boss souls for some of the most unique weapons in the game. But across the 24 boss souls, there are a massive 29 weapons to choose from. So I decided to play through the entire game 29 separate times, once with each of the boss soul weapons to truly work out which one is the best. Let's begin with how the runs are structured, since they are all very similar. I started with a deprived class, gave myself the weapon, gave myself the minimum requirements to use this weapon, and then in this order, I killed Gundir, Vort, Crystal Sage, Deacons, Abyss Watchers, Walnir, then Yorm with the Storm Ruler, Dancer, Dragon Slayer, Pontiff, Aldrich, Twin Princes, and then Soul of Cinder. Along the way, I would grab weapon upgrade materials, and for the rings, I would use Flynn's Ring, the Chlorinthy Ring, Lloyd's Sword Ring, and for weapons that did purely physical damage, my last ring was Lloyd's Shield Ring, but for weapons that dealt elemental damage, I would use the Clutch Rings, which does mean for these two weapons, I killed Osiris to gain access to Arch Dragon Peak to get the Lightning Clutch Ring. And that's pretty much it, so let's get into the list. To start off this monumental list, in last place, the Crystal Sage Rapier. Let's begin with its damage, which is split between physical and magic, and it's low. Like, really low. Even with three rings buffing my damage, I was nearly doing more damage when I did my bare fist run. This made most boss fights last far longer than they should go on for, and for bosses who are resistant to magic like the Crystal Sage or Aldrich, you can imagine how that went. The skill on this weapon, Stance, has two different moves. The L2-R1 is a backstep into a lunging heavy attack, and the L2-R2 is a flurry of attacks. But after using this skill, I found it better just to do two standard attacks as it always dealt more damage. The hitbox of this weapon itself is also small, so when not locking onto an enemy such as during Deacon's fight, it can become a bit of a pain to make contact, but this rapier does have the furthest reaching hitbox out of any thrusting sword in Dark Souls 3, and its biggest plus is when held, it increases item discovery by 50. So if you need to farm an item, use this weapon in your half hand while you use an actually viable weapon in your main hand. In 28th place, the Cleric's Candlestick, a straight sword which has the same physical magic split that the rapier has, but even lower damage in most circumstances. So why did I put this higher? Firstly, because it's a straight sword, its hit radius is much wider, especially when one-handing, which doesn't affect this weapon's damage due to its low strength scaling, and also makes this weapon attack faster. But the main reason is because this weapon doesn't have a charge attack, but rather, when pressing R2, it casts sorceries, which opens up so many possibilities for builds. Now, the spell buff isn't great, meaning the damage from spells isn't very high, but it can open up long range options for this weapon. Now, I didn't use spells during my run, since I wanted to stick to the base weapons as much as possible. Let's talk about its skill. And that's about it. It lights up. It does also show more summon signs when playing online, but that's about it. It doesn't even remove the bleed maggots like normal torches do. But apart from that, the sword is very basic. If you're going for a sorcery based build, then this can be a really fun way to do it, but if you want damage, use any other straight sword. In 27th place is Arstor's Spear. This deck scaling spear is probably one of the most basic weapons on this list, dealing only physical damage which was never bad against any bosses, but at the same time it never really shined. 
With a smaller hitbox as well, it did make all fights up close and personal, and at standard 100 critical meant its damage was always okay. As for its skill, Shield Splitter, which as the name suggests, can bypass the damage negation of a shield, but it also helps that shorter hitbox by extending how far you reach, while also dealing slightly more damage than an R1, but not as much damage as an R2. The spear also has innate poison buildup, but only at 36, which scales up to 47 at 60 luck, which also explains why I didn't even notice during the run, since I didn't proc it once on any boss or enemy. Another small bonus is the 30 HP recovery upon defeating an enemy, which does stack with Ring of the Evil Eye to recover from 60 to 67 HP depending on which level of ring you have, which can make fights like Deacons a little more bearable. At 26th, the Storm Curved Sword, a fast, dex-based physical damage weapon with a unique altered skill. Let's start with that damage, which is about the same as Arstor Spear, which isn't great, but it does attack considerably faster due to its standard Curved Sword moveset, but let's talk about that skill, Tornado, which is a unique version of Spin Slash. It has the same animation with the additional of some wind gust effects which will deal about 50% more damage than Spin Slash. Now this big damage boost over Spin Slash doesn't really mean it's amazing. For the skill plus the follow-up, it dealt about the same damage as two art ones, but the follow-up has a unique property where it will knock humanoid enemies over, which was especially useful in the Deacon's fight to try and clear the Deacons away from the Archdeacon. And with that fast attack speed, I used Pontiff's right eye instead of Lloyd's shield ring to boost the damage by a little more, and the speed of the rolling R1 did also allow for some interesting openings on bosses, plus it has a fun animation. But the damage, once again, was always just okay, landing it at 26th. Coming in 25th is Lothric's Holy Sword, a dex based straight sword with a unique altered skill. Its damage is pretty standard. If you're looking to use only the straight sword aspect of this weapon, just use a broadsword since its attacks do more damage, but there are two reasons you would pick this weapon up. The first reason to pick this sword up is to not use the sword at all, but rather trade it in alongside Lorien's greatsword to get the Twin Prince's greatsword. The second and main reason is its skill, Sacred Lothric Light which is an altered version of the scan skill found on straight swords. The L2R1 has the same animation and same damage as the standard stance skill, which is roughly 35% more than the single R1. But the L2R2 is where things get interesting. It lunges you forward and at the peak of the attack will release a projectile which can stack with the sword's hitbox, which when both hit will deal about 60% more damage than R1, and if only the projectile hits, it deals slightly less than R1. This skill does make the moveset more unique and more fun to use, but it does end up using quite a bit of stamina, so I couldn't combo it into other moves without the risk of not being able to dodge out of an incoming attack. At 24th, the Hollow Slayer Greatsword, which in my opinion is the most basic weapon on this list, but don't let that fool you. It's yet another dex based weapon, but it does actually have a unique R1 moveset and a very nice poking attack when doing a rolling R1 or an R2 which can make hitting slightly more distance enemies nicer. Its damage is in the middle ground when compared to other greatswords, but it does actually deal 20% more damage to hollow enemies, so it can be nice to clear out areas with lots of enemies or even deal more damage to the Deacons or Gale in phase 2 and 3. But apart from that, the skill is a standard version of the stance skill and overall the weapon lands itself in a very nice middle ground. In 23rd place is Roses of Ariandel. Now, I'm guessing most of you were expecting to see this much early on the list, and I was too before I tried this weapon out. The weapon is one of the, what I like to call, all over the place weapons, because it's a whip with a club's moveset which can also cast miracles. Let's talk about those first two things. Because it's a club's moveset, it does attack decently fast, and because it is a whip, it also has quite a large hitbox, but it does mean it can't repost after staggering an enemy. The damage is better than the candlestick and rapier, but not as good as the other weapons mentioned so far, but it does have the addition of bleed to make up for that lack of damage. The weapon scales off strength and dex, but primarily faith, which also leads into the miracle side of this weapon. I once again did not use miracles in the run to stick with the weapon as much as possible, but I'll still talk about it. 
Its spell buff does sit above the Sunlight Talisman, but not by a large margin, but it can make it nice to have the ability to do ranged attacks or even buff yourself, which also leads us into its skill, Awakening, which makes you whip yourself and lose a bit of health, but in return you get a massive 25% buff to miracles for 2 minutes. Obviously this skill wasn't useful during the run, but for a miracle only run this is a must have. At 22nd, the Farron Greatsword. I'm sure quite a few of you are probably disappointed by this placement, but this is probably the most complicated weapon on this list, so let me explain my reasoning. Let's start off with its damage. Purely physical and mainly deck scaling, it's pretty bad, and when taking into account that it's an Ultra Greatsword, it's horrible. Having the lowest damage output out of any Ultra Greatsword, and it's even lower than majority of the normal Greatswords, including the Hollow Slayer Greatsword. Its attack speed is also horrendously slow because you are one-handing this weapon because in your offhand is a dagger, which holds the skill of this weapon, parry. This special version of parry has the same startup frames as a medium shield, but 50% more active frames. But it's still substantially worse than just using a small shield, which I ended up doing for Pontiff. But this dual wielding does open up a very unique moveset. The L1 attack is a 3 attack combo, which I struggled to do anything past the first input since the attack combo lasts so long and it doesn't help that the damage from the dagger is about an 8th the damage of the greatsword. The only times I could use this combo reliably is when I knew a boss would phase transition or would die from its damage, but a few bosses did have some openings that I tried to punish but was usually met with disappointment. In 21st place, the Demon Scar, the only melee weapon in the game that doesn't deal physical damage. Dealing exclusively fire damage, it means that Flynn's Ring does nothing for this weapon since the ring only boosts physical damage, but does mean the fire clutch ring boosted its damage by the full 15%. It is also the lightest curve sword and one of the lightest weapons in the game, weighing just 0.5, and being a curve sword means the attack speed is great, paired with the very passable damage it dealt to every boss, especially to Yorm where it dealt a huge blow. Alright, watch this damage, you guys ready? <laughs> Whoa! Okay, jokes aside, this weapon marks a point in the list where weapons from this point start to become increasingly above average. The skill on this weapon, Spin Slash, is actually a unique version of the skill, which leaves a puddle of magma on the ground after a follow-up R2, which can tick an enemy once if they stand in it, which deals slightly less damage than the R1. To top this weapon off in the best way possible, it can also cast Pyromancies, but with slightly less spell buff than the Pyromancies Parting Flame. But the spell buff that increases with Intelligence and Faith also increases the weapon's damage output, landing it comfortably at 21st. At 20th, Dancer's Enchanted Swords, a set of curved swords dealing physical, magic and fire damage. Let's talk about that crazy damage split. The physical damage is split between both swords, but the magic damage is on the right sword and the fire damage is on the left sword. The fire damage does scale slightly more aggressively, so I decided to use the fire clutching on my run to get the most out of it. When using R1 attacks, only the magic sword attacks, which even with less scaling still does decent damage. But the L1 attack is where it shines, where both swords hit for each input while also having a unique attack that mimics the dancer's attacks. Speaking of mimicking her attacks, the skill of these weapons, Dancer Grace, is the spinning attack Dancer does when she phase transitions. When we do it, you can press L2 to activate once, or you can hold R2 after and you'll keep spinning for as long as your stamina bar or FP bar lasts. Unfortunately, the damage from this skill is quite pathetic. With a plus 3 weapon when fighting Dancer, I managed to hit her 9 times with this attack and only dealt a measly 200 damage. For reference, a normal L1 did 250 damage. So, because of this hilarious yet lackluster skill, and because of its damage split allowing these weapons to be decent against any boss in the game, it lands itself at 20th. At 19th, the Wolf Knight's Greatsword. A physical based greatsword that has a lower base damage than the Hollow Slayer's greatsword, but much greater strength and deck scaling, leading it to having roughly the same AR. And likewise with the Hollow Slayer greatsword, this weapon deals 20% more damage to an enemy type, this time abyssal enemies, which include Walnir, Dragon Slayer armor, Aldrich, and Medir. But back to the damage. 
The R1s are fine on all bosses, but if I wanted to do an R2, I'm pretty sure the bosses would die of old age first. The weapon has the single longest R2 I think I have ever seen, but luckily it has its skill, Wolf Sword, which is similar to Stance by having an L2 R1 attack, which is a double spin dealing about 50% more damage than the standard R1, and is actually relatively quickly with a nice recovery time, and the L2 R2 is a very fast front flip dealing just under twice as much damage as a standard R1 with a slightly longer recovery time, but can pancake humanoid enemies and give you time to recover, and is still leagues ahead of the charged R2. In 18th place, Vort's Great Hammer a frostbitten great hammer dealing only physical damage and scaling entirely off of strength. Let's start with that frostbite, which is the highest frostbite for a single hit in the entire game at a massive 110, which is enough to frostbite any enemy or boss except Soul of Cinder in just 3 hits. If frostbite does proc on an enemy, it will also boost the damage output of this weapon, which as I mentioned earlier scales only off of strength, making it nice not have to split your stats. Its skill, perseverance, didn't really find a use in my run, but still provides a massive poise increase for 6 seconds and absorption increase for 4 seconds. Its stamina consumption was also quite nice, but apart from that, this weapon is pretty much a standard great hammer with the addition of a massive amount of frostbite. At 17th place, Gundyr's Halberd. A strength based weapon with a long reaching skill and an interesting aspect to its damage. Requiring 30 strength and scaling very well off it, the damage from this weapon didn't seem as high as I wanted it to be, but this weapon has a unique damage factor about it called Sweet Spot, which as the name suggests means if you distance yourself away from an enemy just far enough so only the end of the weapon hits, it will deal 12% more damage. And the repost from this weapon is also quite high considering its base damage. The reach of this weapon is also superb which paired with its spinning charge attack allowed me to knock down humanoid enemies such as the Deacons, but away from this, the charge attack is very difficult to get off thanks to its long wind up and even longer double hitting animation. The skill on this weapon, Champion's Charge, is the phase transition attack Gundyr does which is split into two attacks, the first being the charge and then the R2 follow up. This combined attack deals slightly more than a charged R2, but once again was difficult to get the entire attack off, not only due to its duration, but also due to the fact that the follow up R2 input has to be pressed almost immediately after the L2, otherwise only the L2 attack will be inputted followed by a standard charge R2, which put me into interesting situations a couple of times. At 16th, the Moonlight Greatsword, the staple weapon in FromSoft games that I wished was better in this game. The damage as always is primarily magic damage with a side of physical damage, and the weapon scales mainly off of intelligence. The moveset is the same as other greatswords, but the charged R2 on this weapon is altered by creating a high damaging magic projectile, but there is a problem with this attack. If you are too close to an enemy, the projectile will not be created and the resulting damage is less than the R1. So it seems to be doing a similar thing to the sweet spot weapons, where you have to just stand far enough away for both the projectile and the weapon to hit. And when both hit, the damage isn't anything special. About the same as a normal greatsword charged R2. Another massive downside is if you like doing charge attacks, this weapon doesn't make it to the end of late game bosses thanks to each charge using 4 durability of the weapon's 75. The skill does make up for that strange charge attack, Moonlight Vortex, which lights the sword up, plunges it forward in a poking motion and deals a large amount of damage about 7% more than a charge attack, but also a massive amount of poise damage, allowing me to stagger bosses constantly, making this skill a much more consistent method of damage to dealing a strong blow. To be honest, this weapon really holds the title to be the absolute biggest letdown on this list, and as far as I can tell, one of the biggest letdown weapons in the game. Finally, at the midway point, in 15th place is Walnir's Holy Sword, a lightweight faith based greatsword which deals physical damage scaling equally off strength and faith. With a standard greatsword moveset and a sweeping charge attack, the damage from this weapon never let me down, but never blew me away. 
The skill on the other hand is where it does get even better with Wrath of the Gods, which plunges your sword into the ground which can hit an enemy for about the same damage as an R1 and upon release will create a physical explosion which deals the exact same amount of damage as an R2. The first plunge attack was quite difficult to hit an enemy but the massive hitbox of the follow-up explosion would always make contact. As for executing this skill, it can be hard at times as the plunge animation is long but the explosion does follow shortly after making for a fun way to deal some damage forcing you to learn positioning during fights. In 14th place is Gale's Greatsword, a broken, battle-worn Executioner's Greatsword with a fancy skill. As always, let's start with its damage, which is nearly exactly the same as the Executioner's Greatsword, purely physical and scaling slightly better off strength. But due to its weapon being broken, it does both strike and thrust, leading to dealing more damage against both armoured and unarmoured enemies. This damage was also nearly exactly the same as Walney's Holy Sword against every boss, but the reason why it is above is due to the charge poking attack and its skill, Blade of Peril which is a two-part attack starting with an initial flip with a follow-up R1 and R2, but there is an issue with this skill. Majority of the damage of the skill comes from the follow-up, which can be difficult to get off against most bosses due to how long it lasts. When compared to a standard R1, the first L2 input only does about half the damage, but together with the R1 follow-up would deal about 60% more damage, and the R2 follow-up would deal a little over double the damage. This skill does create a true combo though, through the R1 to L2 to R1 moveset, but I did also encounter something strange about this skill several times during the run, where if I wasn't either standing perfectly still or moving forward, the first input would move me backwards making my attacks miss the boss. So majority of the time, I felt doing the normal charge R2 was better, dealing just slightly less damage than the L2 R2 combo. At 13th place is the Great Sword of Judgement, the first magic weapon on this list that doesn't just completely suck or isn't a massive letdown. The main reason is due to its damage and how it is boosted by the skill. The damage, scaling strongest off of intelligence and is split nearly equally between physical and magic, being a 55% and 45% of the weapon's damage respectively, will deal once again about the same damage as Walner's Holy Sword and Gale's Great Sword. But thanks to its skill, Stance of Judgement, it can overtake them. As the name suggests, it is yet another altered version of Stance. This time, both the R1 and R2 attack will coat the weapon in a buff dealing an extra 80 magic damage for 35 seconds. The R2 follow-up, alongside the magic buff, also releases a projectile which also contributes to its damage even if the weapon itself hits, but does have quite a long cooldown after the attack goes off, making it a high risk, high reward attack. So if you're looking to just get the magic buff, the R1 follow-up takes about the same time as a normal R1 and will deal about 35% more damage than a standard R1. Fourth place is Frida's Great Scythe, a twin scythe with an absolutely insane moveset. The twin part of this weapon is actually quite interesting when not talking about the damage output of this weapon, but rather the split, which is physical and magic and scales off of all stats, but primarily dex and intelligence. The split on this weapon is actually between each weapon, with the main scythe dealing only physical and the second scythe dealing only magic damage, allowing for you to choose what damage to deal against certain bosses. But hold on, where is the second scythe? Well, it actually appears when using its skill, Elfrida's Stance, which is an insane 3 attack combo with R1 inputs that doesn't actually use any FP. The FP consumption comes from the R2 follow up and deals exclusively magic damage, starting with a single swipe that leaves a frost patch on the ground, which builds up frost continuously and will deal damage twice, with the second hit doing a large amount of damage and stance as the patch explodes. And to continue with that frost, both the weapons also deal 45 frost build up. To top that all off, the scythe also has sweet spot damage, once again dealing an extra 12% more damage to enemies and also has a unique two-handed R1 moveset similar to Frida's moveset. All these reasons lead to this weapon being ranked fairly highly, but its normal moveset is quite slow and the overall damage output isn't particularly high, leading it to 12th place. Oh, it's so cool! It's such a cool moveset! In 11th place, the Dragon Slayer Sword Spear, 
an extremely heavy lightning based spear. I'll start with the weight. At a massive 14.5, it is by far the heaviest spear in the game, but this weight does also pair with the damage, having the highest attack rate of any spear. As for the damage itself, it is one of the two lightning weapons on this list, dealing physical and a small amount of lightning damage, but this damage can be buffed similar to the Great Sword of Judgment thanks to its skill Falling Bolt, which not only creates a ranged lightning bolt attack that deals about double the damage of an R1 attack, but also coats the weapon with 80 lightning damage for 35 seconds. Unfortunately, majority of the time I couldn't use the bolt attack of this skill because it takes very long to get off and the range isn't great, so I found it better to use before a fight just to buff the weapon. The attack of this weapon is also interesting. Having a part spear, part glaive moveset, when two-handed, which is what I used during the run, the R1 is a halberd's moveset, but the charge attack is a spear's moveset. This does mean for R1 attacks it can be a little slow at times, but apart from that, the lightning damage of this weapon really helped it through majority of the bosses, landing it at 11th. And finally, into the top 10, starting off with the Twin Prince's Greatsword, a fire damaging greatsword that you can't actually get on your first playthrough. Let's start with that, because it's also the only weapon in the game that you can't acquire on a new game, because the weapon doesn't come from a boss soul, but rather two. To get this weapon, you need to get Lothric's Holy Sword and Lorien's Greatsword, and then combine them at Ludlith. Also coming from the Twin Princes, who are an endgame boss, this does mean this sword can only really be used on DLC bosses in NG+, or you just have to advance to NG+, 2 to play through the game with it. But as for the weapon itself, its standard greatsword moveset and physical fire damage split is nothing we haven't seen yet, but its scaling can accommodate any build in the game, thanks to its scaling basically equally of all stats. Its skill though is why it places so much higher above other greatswords, Sacred, Light and Flame, which is another altered version of Stance with the R1 follow-up performing the R2 follow-up of Lothric's Holy Sword, and the R2 follow-up performing the skill of Lorien's Great Sword. The R1 follow-up deals about 30% more damage than Lothric's Holy Sword, and the R2 deals about 35% less damage than Lorien's Great Sword, which actually makes sense considering those weapons are a Straight Sword and Ultra Great Sword respectively, and this weapon is a Standard Great Sword, making this weapon a very nice middle ground, and overall an extremely diverse and fun weapon. Worth it. Oh! At 9th place, the Frayed Blade, a katana that is the only weapon on this list dealing dark damage. Let's start with the biggest downside of this weapon, the massive 40 dex requirement, which is the highest dex requirement in the game. Now this isn't a massive issue considering this weapon comes from Medea's boss soul, and this super high dex requirement does mean that you don't need to level it past this point, since leveling from the base requirements of this weapon to 99 in all stats only gets you about 99 extra physical damage. And yes, only physical since the dark damage on this weapon is non-scaling, and is locked at a fixed amount depending on the weapon level. This katana does also have 34 to 50 bleed depending on what your luck is, which plays a massive role when taking into account its skill, Hold, which is an altered version of Hold found in other katanas, with the R1 being a slam down releasing a trail of dark damage, which both the katana and trail can hit. But then there's the R2 follow up, which is a flurry of four attacks which can be spammed over and over again and, as far as I can tell, is the highest source of bleed damage for a single input in the entire game, but does do less damage than the R1 follow-up, and also costs less FP. This single skill not only made dealing damage and bleeding bosses easy, but also made this the most fun weapon on this list by a large margin. In 8th, the Old King's Great Hammer, a fire-based great hammer with a poise monster skill. The damage from this weapon is very high, with the fire damage scaling off of Int and Faith and the physical damage scaling off of Strength, which is also alone nearly higher than Vought's Great Hammer. The moveset of the weapon is a standard great hammer, but the skill once again spices things up with Molten Perseverance, which, as the name suggests, is an altered version of the Perseverance skill, with the first input being a normal Perseverance cast, but now has a R2 follow-up which slams the hammer into the ground twice, which not only has a hitbox now, but both times will release a pool of magma onto the ground which deals insane damage, and most likely the highest poise damage in the entire game. 
This skill takes a while to cast, but because of the perseverance aspect to it, your defenses and poise increase so much that you can tank any hit you want, which allowed me to cancel Soul of Cinder's flurry attack at the beginning of phase 2. A problem with this skill is mobility. The skill is completely still, so when fighting anything that moves, you may encounter issues with it actually making contact, but if it does, most enemies won't move anyways because you stagger them almost immediately. At 7th, the Profaned Greatsword. A physical only ultra great sword with a blazing skill and charge attack. Scaling off strength and dexterity and appearing to scale better for strength, but after a bit of testing I found it actually scales better off of dex. The weapon has a standard ultra great sword moveset, but the perking charge attack now adds 55 damage to the weapon. The skill on the other hand, Profane Flame, is an altered version of the stomp uppercut skill, but on the uppercut attack will coat the weapon with 85 damage for 45 seconds. Unfortunately, after a bit of testing, once the skill is activated, the charge attack does not add the extra 55 damage, but the fire buff is plenty of additional damage for standard attacks. Now likewise with the stomp skill on other ultra great swords, it uses a monumental amount of stamina, needing 26 endurance to be able to roll after the attack. So I found it best to use before a fight to buff the weapon, or use it if I knew the boss was going to die, or could be completely thrown into the air, such as in the Abyss Watchers fight. Now I do have bias towards this weapon, since it's the weapon that I used on my first playthrough of Dark Souls 3. But, to top things off, it is one of the two Ultra Great Swords you can use on an SL1 run, and is one of the highest damaging SL1 weapons. In 6th place, Yorm's Great Machete, the second all over the place weapon on this list, because it's called a machete, looks like a giant cleaver, but is actually a great axe. Now this weapon is actually quite basic, dealing physical damage and only scaling entirely off of strength, but also having one of the highest strength requirements in the game at 38. It has a standard great axe moveset, but also has the longest reaching hitbox. Its skill, wall cry, lets out a yell, and increases damage by about 10% for 30 seconds, but it seems to vary based on weapon level and stats, so my guess is it actually increases the scaling of the weapon, but I had no conclusive way to prove this. The skill also changes the charge attack to a double slash, mimicking one of Yorm's attacks, but I found it very difficult to get this attack off without getting punished, so I rather just used R1s when Warcry was active. To be completely honest, the biggest reason this weapon is so high is thanks to its high attack rate, which is one of the highest physical attack rates in the game, and at 66 strength and above it holds the number one spot for the highest physical AR. Fifth place, the Fire Link Greatsword, the weapon that has been with us since the very beginning. As the name might suggest, it is a fire based greatsword with a standard moveset which requires 20 strength and 10 in all other stats, but only scales off of strength and dex, which does mean the fire damage, likewise with the dark damage on the frayed blade, doesn't actually scale. But this fire damage can still be increased thanks to its skill, Ember, which sadly isn't the massive flurry Solofson does at the beginning of phase 2 but is rather a slam down into the ground which deals about the same damage as a charged R2 but also creates a lingering fire trail on the ground which can hit an enemy once more if they are standing in it dealing about 40% extra damage and for humanoid enemies will completely knock them over. As I hinted at earlier, the skill also coats the weapon in 85 damage for 45 seconds which helps greatly with the standard attacks as the skill itself is quite slow, especially the recovery, so I found it most useful to use before a fight to buff the weapon. To finish this weapon off, I just wanted to say I think this is the most perfect weapon to get from the final boss of the final game in this amazing series. So kudos to you FromSoft for edging your player base for 5 years who wanted to use the Bonfire Sword. Fourth, the Demon's Great Axe. Another great axe, but this time with a lot of fire damage and an absolutely devastating skill. Let's make this one short and sweet. 
With the standard Great Axe moveset, dealing fire and physical damage and scaling off of all stats, with physical coming from strength and dex and the fire damage coming from int and faith, I pulled about 10% more damage against the majority of the bosses compared to the last Great Axe, Yom's Machete. The skill on this weapon though, Demonic Flare, is a large slam onto the ground which takes about as long as a charge attack and has one hit from the weapon and one hit from the large fire based explosion it creates which can still hit enemies even if the weapon itself doesn't hit. It deals about 15% more damage than a normal charge attack but deals huge amounts of stance damage allowing me to completely stagger any humanoid enemies and even larger enemies quite consistently. The final big plus of this weapon is actually where it comes from, because it technically doesn't come from a boss, but a normal fire demon found in the catacombs of Carthus. But the best part about this soul is that it doesn't give one weapon, but rather two, which leads me perfectly into the final three weapons. Starting off the big three, the Demon's Fist, a fire based fist weapon with not only a fun and useful skill but also a very adaptable moveset. The physical damage from this weapon, which is where most of the damage comes from, scales with strength, with the fire damage scaling with int and faith. The output of this weapon is great, when counting just one fist, but put both into the equation and it becomes so much better. With the L1 input landing its damage above majority of the weapons on this list, but there's still just the R1 attack which is a single punch. This diversity pin 1 punch and 2 punch attacks allowed me to punish bosses much more effectively and be far more aggressive, which also created some of the largest on screen numbers out of all the runs, such as the 3k damage on Twin Princes or 2000 damage on Soul of Cinder. But this damage just keeps getting better with its skill, Flame Whirlwind, which upon the first L2 input will spin you around, but it can be followed up with an R2 input, slamming the fist into the ground and creating a large eruption from the ground. But to tie this skill in perfectly to its adaptable moveset, this follow up can be inputted at three different points, either at after the first, second or third spin, allowing you to perfectly adjust how long you want the attack to go for to punish an enemy as efficiently as possible. And for one final thing about this skill that really cements this weapon in third place, the fact that it did this to Abyss Watchers. Oh my god, this weapon can stun like abyss watches! In second place, Lorian's Greatsword. A fire based ultra greatsword which I first mentioned 23 weapons ago. Let's start this one off strong. Requiring strength and dex to use, but scaling off all stats thanks to its physical and fire damage split, this sword, even if you are only leveling strength, has the highest attack rate out of all the ultra great swords. And when leveling all stats, you can see this attack rate become over 100 higher than any other ultra great sword. But don't worry, because we can take this even further thanks to its skill, Flame of Lorien, which we have already seen on the Twin Prince's Great Sword, and is also very similar to the Profaned Great Sword skill. But this skill has two unique features which take it above and beyond those two skills. Firstly, when compared to the Profane Greatsword, this skill does add 85 damage to the weapon for the same 45 seconds, but this time, the follow-up is not needed to apply this buff, and will apply on the first part of the stomp animation, allowing the buff to be applied more reliably during combat. The second reason this skill is so much better is thanks to a lingering fire trail that appears on the ground after the follow-up attack, similar to the one found on the Firelink Greatsword and will deal about an additional 25% of damage compared to the initial attack, which in and of itself is already one of the hardest hitting skills in the entire list. To polish the weapon off just that much more, it has an amazing standard moveset of the normal Ultra Greatsword with its poking charge attack and rolling attack, and is also one of the lightest Ultra Greatswords in the game at just 14 weight. So thanks to this insane AR, its skill and its weight, it lands itself very comfortably in second place, but it just doesn't compare with the number one spot. And at the number one spot, the Dragon Slayer's Great Axe, an absolute monster of a weapon and possibly the most insane weapon in the entire game. Let's start this beast off with how I felt after finishing the run. 
So for every weapon, once I completed the run, I would place them on the list and write notes about why the weapon is placed where it is, or even notes to test certain things on a weapon. For example, here's what I wrote after the Firelink Greatsword. For the Dragon Slayer Great Axe, the only thing I wrote after completing the run was Nuclear Warhead Inbound, which perfectly describes this weapon. Being the second lightning weapon on this list and requiring 40 strength to use, which is also pretty much the strength cap for this weapon, only garnering about 32 extra damage at 99 strength. But this weapon also scales off of Dex and Faith, in which the Faith will increase the lightning damage, but only by a small margin. The R1s from this thing were on average 15% higher than the Demon Great Axe, which previously held the title for the strongest R1s on this list, and the charged R2s are also about 15% higher. But you would basically never use the R2 because of the reason I called this weapon nuclear. It's skill, Falling Bolt, which has the same name as the Dragon Slayer Sword Spear's skill, but it's a completely different attack. This time, mimicking Dragon Slayer Armor's slam attack, where you raise the weapon above your head, slamming it down for a massive hit, followed by a powerful lightning bolt. The skill is not only faster than a charge attack, but hits for about 25% more damage, which, when translated into actual damage, is insane. When fighting Abyss Watchers with the weapon upgraded to plus 2, not only did the weapon have the highest backstab damage at 507, but the skill completely pancaked the Abyss Watcher, dealing an insane 848 damage. Or when fighting Aldrich, I hit an absolutely mind-boggling 1800 damage. Everyone, I present to you the best Dark Souls 3 boss soul weapon, and possibly the most powerful weapon in the entire game, the Dragon Slayer Great Axe. <laughs> There you have it, my ranking for Dark Souls 3 best boss soul weapon. After nearly 100 hours of footage and nearly a terabyte of storage used later, this monster of a video is done. For the next truly the best video, I'm probably going to skip Dark Souls 2 for now because the game has over 40 boss soul weapons. So instead, I'm going to do Dark Souls 1 first. So subscribe so you don't miss out on that. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed the absolute magnum opus of this channel, and thank you all so much for watching not only this video, but all my videos over the past 10 months, and completely changing the course of this year for me. I love you all so much, and I'll see you all later.